the whole idea of this idea is a lot of people uh, don't compile their kernels with frame pointers. And uh, we want to get user space uh, stack traces from the kernel. So when an NMI goes off, we want to, you know, with perf usually does a bunch of NMIs, they get your information uh, from your stack traces. And <clears throat> you're like, um, to know where, you know, you're profiling your user space objects. Uh, easiest ways, uh, frame pointers. But if the frame pointers are turned off because they do actually add overhead, so some people turn them off, the kernel has very little, much, doesn't really have much of a clue to do it. Perf will do like a cheating thing where it says, okay, just give me a couple K worth of your stack, or maybe, I don't know, how big, how big is it? Um, three, uh, how much do you K? What? what? By default, how by default it's what? Eight kilobytes? Yeah, so it does 8K, two pages. 8K every time you do a snapshot. 8K, 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 8K. So, um, uh, and then what it does, it uses dwarf and stuff like that to unwind it and figure it out on the user space when it gets back to user space. Um, so, uh, someone actually, uh, I always have to mark about the overhead there um, uh, in the report from LWN from John Corbett. He actually, they said, you know, uh, the kernel build increases by 2.4%. Uh, when you enable uh, frame pointers as without frame pointers. And they say um, there's even some Python programs that increase um, or slow down by like 10%. So it does have an impact. But we still want these things. And some people say maybe it's worth just doing that so we don't have to do 8K or whatnot. Um, oops. There you go. So quick, here's how frame pointers work. Usually you have a stack pointer or a frame pointer. And then we do is the frame pointer actually is just a, like when you call function, it'll put the, the stack, we'll just say, okay, it'll save a register that says, here's where the next frame is. So uh, when you, oops, let me go back. That's not what I wanted to do. So basically, if you have frame pointers, the kernel will get the first stack pointer, and then it, it, from the stack pointer, it can figure out where the frame, like inside the stack, there's a pointer to the next frame from the previous function call. And then it, it says, oh, that's where it is in the stack. And then you could go up into the stack, grab that. And that, if there's another frame corner, you could, Go and do the next one. So it gives you a nice little table, which is, you know, where you get your stack. Um, oops. Then um, in the kernel, uh, we used to try to do like dwarf unwinding. And uh, inside the kernel, uh, we have frame pointers disabled a lot of times for the same reasons of performance. So what Josh came up with, because uh, they needed a reliable, um, way of unwinding because what usually unwinder does without orc unwinding and frame pointers disabled it'll actually just say give me the stack the stack is a fixed size of usually like 8k within the kernel maybe 16k or whatever and just scans the stack until it finds something that points into text space hey this is text space boom well we'll print it out hey it's text space we'll print it out so that's why you get those little question marks in your stack traces that means we found this on the stack but we don't really know if this was actually a function that was called so uh the orc unwinder was required for um, live kernel patching, because live kernel patching needed to have an accurate way of knowing where functions actually were. So uh, Josh worked on that, and it got added um, in uh, uh, 4.14. And basically, the, the overview, I might be not quite doing this quite right way, but this is the way I kind of figured out what how um, ORC Unwinder kind of works. You know, you get the, you know, you say, I want to get a backtrace of the stack. So you have your, uh, you know, your instruction pointer and your stack pointer, and you have this uh, orc unwind IP table. So it takes the IP address and says, it searches this uh, sorted list. So it's a binary search really quick. You find a spot, say, here's the, uh, where my address, address is. Basically, the, um, the, the table is a range of addresses. It's not every single address in the kernel. It's just a range of addresses, and you find the one that represents this range. Because this range will then tell you, uh, it'll point to another table that's not sorted, that has a bunch of information to say, here's where the like the stack offset of to get you where back to who called you. So the, the second table gives you inf enough information to use the registers at that point to find how to get to the next stack. And then from there, you can say, okay, give me the, I know where the instruction pointer is. I can now go back into the table again, and it will give me the second function, and then I could do the unwinding. So this is the orc unwinder from the kernel. Um, yeah, and that's basically the same thing. Whoops, why is it? How many things do I have in here? I think I just went through. It's just showing the whole thing, basically. So, 
I'm trying to get more into the discussion area of this thing. So uh, then it was funny because at the Tracing Summit uh, last year at, in London, we had this whole thing about we were all talking about, you know, how do we solve this? And we looked at e, uh, EF frames. What, what's that called? Uh, e, e, EH frames. Thank you. Somebody, we looked at doing that. I got, yeah, whatever. Uh, we were looking at that and we looked at some other things and we were like, well, maybe we get the GCC folks to maybe be able to provide something for us to help us to come up with this. And we we're all thinking about this is back in November of what, uh, 2022. And we were just, just brainstorming it. We had we wrote up about an article on it. And then someone pointed to me and said, uh, hey, Steve, go check out this uh, phon Phionix, Phonix, whatever article. I can't never pronounce the name of it, uh, article. There's something called S-frames that's going on. So I see this. I'm like, my God, this is exactly what we talked about at the Tracing Summit. I got to find out more about this. And then I went to FOSDEM. And I ran it to Jose. I said, hey, Jose, um, do you know anything about this S-frame thing? And he's like, I actually have someone working on it who actually created it, and she's here, and she's here right now, Hindu, um, who is like, I'm like, great, I need to talk to her because I need to get in the kernel. He's like, thank, he's like, well, actually, we'll be really excited because she's a um, GCC developer, compiler developer, extremely bright, knows everything about the compile of the kernel and everything that, or I'm sorry, of the, of the compiler's infrastructure and thing, much more than I do, but she's still new for the kernel and doesn't really know how to actually get into the kernel. I said, great. I think we'll be able to make a great team. We can work together and try to get this done. Unfortunately, at the time, Google had a lot of layoffs and uh, my workload changed completely. So I was kind of pulled off of this work quite a bit. I had someone else to work on this. He was pulled off of this work. Um, but luckily at Kernel Recipes, when I brought this up again with um, Brandon Gregg, Another person, uh, Josh there said, hey, Steve, will you be okay if I work on this? And I'm just like, thank you, please. Um, learn to delegate. So, <laughs> uh, so the idea is basically S-Frames is just like the Orc on Winder, but for user space. And uh, what we have now is uh, the Elf, what they have actually in bin utils right now, Indu is actually implemented. By the way, she's the one that actually wrote the spec. She's the one kind of, this is cre her creation. Um, so, uh, what's in GC, uh, GLibc right now it does have uh, uh, ELF sections called S frames. So my idea was for the simple side, the simple static side. You have a, a code when you call um, exec it, it goes. There's a, a bin ELF file in the kernel that actually parses all the the sections of the ELF file to know where it is. It could say, hey, there's an S frame there, and it could set a flag or just a pointer or something in the task truck so that later on we can then get access to that. Now here's the problem um, with that. Let's see if I have it here, because I haven't been really looking at my own slides. Yes, here's the problem we have that we have to be careful about. NMI is usually a lot of times where we do our stack trace. Thing is, the S-frames is in user space, which means that it's highly likely that's even in memory. It's on, hard, it's on the disk. So we need to get to that. We can't get to that from NMI context. And one of the things, remember that 8K of data that's recorded? Um, say if you have a long kernel function call and you're taking, a, say you take a thousand um, uh, NMIs doing your profiling in that long uh, call, you're getting 8K of data that's exactly the same a thousand times in the ring buffer, which is, you know, that's kind of uh, expensive real estate. You don't want to be duplicating this data over and over again. So ideally, what we want to do is just say, hey, NMI went off. And it perf says, I want a stack trace. And it says, OK, we'll set, a, we'll set a flag and say there's work to do. Set a flag saying, OK, go back. And then um, is like here, if there's no work to do, we say, OK, we go back to user space. Otherwise, if there is, we'll do the ptrace path. Actually, we found out coming from NMI, there is no ptrace path. And we were going to do all this hacks and stuff like that until Josh pinged me on IRC. He goes, can't we just call IRQ work? And I'm like, wow, that was really a simple answer. Uh, yes, IRQ work is just a flag that will trigger an interrupt. What? Peter Zilstra. Yeah. Peter Zilstra. Uh, no, no, that's right. Matthew, that's right. At the same time, that's right. This is, I was, okay, I have to get this right. I, I'll, I'll go back. I was talking to Matthew. Matthew said that to me. I went to Josh and said, 
Joss, did you know we could use IRQ work? And Joss said, yeah, I know. Peter Zilser just told me that too at the exact same time. <laughs> so, Because <laughs> I was talking to Matthew when Josh was talking to Peter Zilser, and we've got the exact same response back to use IRQ work. It's just a way of saying, if you're telling yourself, you could basically say on this CPU, trigger an interrupt. And so if you're in NMI context, you're, it's really tricky. NMI context could happen at any time. So the logic there is very, very fragile. So it's, it's very careful about how we do things there. So you don't really want to do some magic P trace going back to user space. So if you are in user space, you just say, OK, set an IRQ uh, work, which will say, when interrupts are back enabled, you're going to trigger an interrupt right away. NMI interrupts are disabled, so it's not going to happen then. So as soon as NM, uh, NMI goes back to user space, interrupts are enabled, and boom, you're right back into the kernel, into IRQ work, in a place where when it goes back to user space, it has the ptrace path. So that's the answer that we're going to do. So there's a little, I kind of left that out on this patch, or on these uh, slides. So from there, we could actually do, oh, whoops, let me go back, actually. So the idea is on the ptrace path, this is where we could actually do the map uh, on the way for ptrace, we can schedule out. We can pull stuff from storage into memory. So you just set a flag, does IRQ work? It, sets, it says, okay, on the way back to user space, we're going to pull in um, <clears throat> the user space tag once. So we, it's for every, so if you have a thousand um, perf events that are going on, it's just going to have to say. It will do the kernel stack, kernel stack, kernel stack, because that constantly changes at everything. But if the user space stack isn't isn't going to change until you go back to user space, so you can just you don't need to copy it over and over and over again. So this requires a little bit of modification of perf. It requires a little bit of modification of ftrace because it does the same thing, but it's doable. So, whoops, I'm going back the wrong way. And just um, one other thing I have to like, okay, one thing I'm worried about for Ftrace side is we have relocatable, relocatable addresses. And this was kind of like throwing this blurb out. I really do want a way to have the kernel to be able to figure out, uh, hey, here's some address. I have to know where it is mapped into the file. All it do is basically give me the, the map. Basically, I want this information in my Ftrace code. Perf does it from, uh, Perf doesn't need it per se, although how do you do relocatable addresses so if it's a relocate, if you get some random address and that's changed every time it executes, uh, I guess the perf will actually look at, how does perf do that? Uh, get above the, the, from the thing. I was quite curious about that. You get, meta, you get metadata for the M maps that you are loading, then then you get the symbol table, and then you do the, the map. Okay. So anyway, um, a little bit too much now. She said she needed five minutes, but that's now your turn. <laughs> So yeah, S frame for JIT, all of this is quite evolving, but it is in the works as in there, there are asks for it. So um, I have a few things that I can talk about. Uh, again, a disclaimer, this is all in the scoping you know, um, stage right now, but basically what, I'm, what we're trying to do is answer these basic questions. Um, how does stack tracing work in general for digit environments? Can S frame make a difference there? And I think what's tied in here as well is the question: um, Does Linux really want? What's the use case in Linux to go figure out what's the JIT environment or what is that JIT runtime doing at this specific time? So I'm not clear on those aspects. But assume all of this is somehow figured out, and we do say that yes, S frame makes a difference here. So then I. I think at some point we will need to answer this question as well. Um, what are the requirements that this format will need to fulfill to support JIT use case? So um, all of this is evolving, but I have some things to say that on each of these. And if you have inputs, then let's talk more on all of this. So basically, how does uh, how does track tracing work in JIT environments? To what I have seen so far, it seems, yeah, there are a variety of JIT beasts out there, right? But uh, across all of this, from what I've seen, there are a couple of, most of these JIT environments will have a couple of stack frame layouts. So so to speak, interpreted, compiled um, stack frame layout and VMs even, even VMs own code. So typically it's the, it's the JIT, um, is a JIT runtime, or is a JIT runtime that basically knows how to how to walk through these stack traces and then give the user uh, the stack trace? So at this point, 
again, the question does come back, do we need that functionality in the kernel to go figure what is it that the JIT environment and the application is doing? So open-ended right now. So once that's figured out, we still need to see how can S-Frame make difference? Um, again, there could be a potential there in the sense that if you put something like a format in these environments, something like S-Frame, it does relieve um, the JIT environment from the responsibility of keeping it, you know, specifically in all of these different stack layouts. So there could be potential there, and the potential is mostly around, you know, streamlining things, how you are backtracing across uh, different environments. Um, there could be potential also in terms of, you know, the overhead, like right now across these interpreted and um, compiled stack frames and so on. Um, maybe you're keeping this information somewhere on the stack or maybe in a separate code you know, separate code cache or separate section somehow, which is within the purview of the JIT environment. So there could be potentials there that, you know, the overheads are lesser. But again, this is all very hypothetical and up in the air at this time. So assume we have answers to some of these questions and we do say that, yes, we want to have some support in S-Frame for JIT, right? So uh, I have th some thoughts on, uh, on this, but before we get into any of this, I think, there is something, uh, this is something inseparable at this time with S-Frame, which is that S-Frame is a format that's that, that's simple and it, it relies on really some basic things as in it relies on knowing what that ABI is. So if it is x86, it says, I know exactly where the return address is going to be. It's, uh, you know, once you identify CFA, it's at a specific offset from CFA. Or it says, if it's the other ABI, I know that the return address is a register or it's in the frame record and so on. So this information is tied in S-Frame. So there is a, this is, so if you're talking about extending S-Frame to different stack layouts, which is what JIT, um, you know, runtimes would do, um, we need to, we need to make sure that these, um, this is representable in, in uh, S-Frame. So, it, you could come to a middle ground saying that even if it is uh, interpreted compiled frames and whatnot, if it is possible for these runtimes to ensure that, you know, see it, the, the return register is at a specific offset, it's still representable. Otherwise, S frames need some more story to represent, right? So that's the prerequisite. The stack frame layouts are somehow PS ABI compliant or similar looking, you know. Um, so with that said, what is it that we need to support from S uh, from um, so uh, actually, I'm like hoping you will have something to say. Um, no, um, basically the idea that I'm, uh, it's basically, you know, the JIT and dynamic linking and stuff like that. We need a way to represent that. Now, what's, what do you think would be a good way of representing the S-frame work that any JIT, uh, I don't know if you, do we want, does BPF have um, um, stack as well? I think BPF, I believe it uses frame pointers. Okay. So in the kernel, if we, we don't know about BPF in the ORC unwinder, right. but if we get to an address that we don't recognize, an IP address right. we don't recognize, we, just, we try frame pointers. And if that so, works, then we keep going. So actually, my um, what I would like to have is like a dynamic link library that will need the pass information. And then so let's say if we're running JavaScript, like Chrome, you have Chrome running JavaScript. I want the backtrace all the way from the kernel up into Chrome, up into JavaScript mm -hmm. and see everything. Now. How hard would it be to get that information? Well, I, I think you have two options that I can think about. One is, like I said, make a standard so that if you're generated code and you want to be unwinded through, just always use frame pointers. And that way, um, the but, kernel- what, but Let's say if there, no, like, like always use frame pointers. That means that we have a, a performance benefit, a performance hit. We in want the generated this, code, yes. What? In the generated code, yeah. You would have frame pointers in the generated code, yes. not the rest of the system. But yeah, you're right. But, and then the other option would be, have the generated code also generate S frame for its functions. So I guess my one question that you guys were talking between for, I'm going to try to articulate it a little bit here, is the, uh, what is S frame have all the necessary information that could be used from just like from the kernel point of view, which is just registers and stack addresses to say, hey, here's a table to, <laughs> I, I would think so, unless the stack is complicated. Like it's not just always at a, like if they align the stack and then the stack pointer is stored on the original stack pointer is stored on the stack somewhere else. Hmm. Um, S frame is, is really simple. So it doesn't have all the complexities that dwarf would, would be able to find different, you know, stacks. Like, 
Oh, so mean so this JIT code means that there's a Java Java or JavaScript uh, JIT code. It could be either any of these. Okay, so that's yeah. the user space. Oh, oh, so yeah. we are trying to just answer the question of what is it that a JIT environment may take. Now the specifics may vary, like JavaScripts V8 engine may do something then different than what Java JVM may yeah, do. Yeah, right? of course. But and uh, there is uh, something. Uh, so JIT code needs their uh, their previous their original, uh, or say byte code or something like that. Yes. And that that byte code usually uh, let's say uh, run uh, by your interpreter, and JIT code will be uh, using the, the the part of the the byte code or through byte code. Well, I actually, would call both of those jitted code, right? One is interpreted and the other is compiled. So I generally just use that terminology. I don't know. So if even if it's interpreted, you whatever whatever byte code and then it goes to either interpretation or compilation, right? Yeah, but yes. uh, uh, interpreted uh, what's if usually that the interpreted uh, what's it, or the byte code will be uh, what's uh, it, using a uh, different uh, stack. Yeah. Yeah, I know we're over, but we're, we, I know it's over, so, but we'll a few more minutes. I think that, so interpreted is less of a problem because you're, uh, the, the, the problem is that from the instruction pointer, you want to get all the way down. Uh, so if you're, if, if the code is interpreted, that's not an issue. If it's compiled, it's jitted, then you want to get from the instruction pointer down. And I think the only thing that the JIT compiler needs to do is just generate an F, S frame for whatever that range mm -hmm. that it has. Jitted, yeah. and it should be done. Yeah. But you have to find it. You have to find that as well. Yes. Oh, wait, no, no, OK. So, okay. So, this is, so this is how we're going to do dynamic linking and something like that. We plan on having a system call of some kind. This is like a second. This is phase two, probably maybe uh, next year, or an LSFFM or something like that. We'll be talking about this or something. But uh, we're looking at a system call. Right now, once we get the format saying, if, if, JIT, if these guys will do this, it will, like, when you create the call and it's when you execute, it will need a system call. Dynamic linker will need to do it. Something to, or it doesn't even need a system call. Here's another thing is, I don't know if we want to just have some sort of address that the kernel could query and say. I mean, that's one thing. part of the problem is knowing the, the content we need from the JITs, right? Yes. How to describe how to work their stack. The other part of the problem is creating an ABI with the kernel that would allow a growable area to kind yep. of add, allow those JITs. First thing. Add, <laughs> but to add the, all those tiny bits of information without calling the kernel for That's each and every new function that is generated or removed or reclaimed. Yeah. So we could actually find that's the question is do we use our sync or uh, our, 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 our what we called your restartable sequences? No, no, no. It's not. No, no. I'm saying, no, I'm saying if we have a way of like just something that says that tells the kernel or, or maybe in the beginning of the program it says, here's the information that, or we have a table. Maybe we can even have a table in user space. Here's the table that tells us where the, S frame stuff will be. So, like, you need a chunk of memory that is shadowed, and all the JITs are putting the way you unwind, the way you walk back the stack in that block. Right, but it's not a shadow stack. Because it's once it's it's just once it's jitted, you create the table and then you leave it. It's not modified during while the execution happens. Sure, but the JIT is. Just you, throwing away those things and making new ones. Oh yeah, if it's if it's constantly doing that, yeah. then you're right. It has to create. It has to, it has to be part of the JIT. It, yes. uh, the JIT will actually do it. And if we have but, something registered that it just updates one point of location, yes. Yeah. So that way we need the format to support being relocated. Yeah. And other requirements, right? Like basic requirements. I think that's what this is about. Yeah. Right? So okay. So since this is where, uh, first of all, thank you very much. <laughs> and.